Greetings, fellow Earthlings, and welcome to Tales from the Hoop, a podcast dedicated to diving into the weird, wild, and wacky stories from basketball history. I am your host, Ricky Freck, and today I will be telling you a story to my brother. Blazer Dave. That's right. Uh, okay, so today's, I'm going to say up at the top, um, I am an amateur basketball historian. Uh, so there's probably going to be some stuff in this that I get wrong. I'm going to point you at the end to some better resources that you should, if you're interested in this story, you should definitely go seek out. Uh, this is like a, you know, ha ha funny time for some jokesters on the internet. So don't, uh, you know, I'm not like changing anything or making anything up, but maybe seek out some better resources. Cause Dave has no idea. Um, as usual, he has no idea what we're about to talk about. Um, you do, if you're listening, because you've seen the title of the episode. <laughs> so if you're like coming here to get a very in-depth look at the topic, uh, you've come to the wrong place, but I'll, I'll send you in the right space uh, relatively soon. I am very excited to hear what we've got. I will say preseason started recently for the, all those that follow ah. the NBA regularly. And Can you imagine, feels... do you think there's a person out there who listens to this podcast and doesn't follow the NBA regularly? That's fair. Um, I just want to say happy preseason, everybody. I'm so excited. I've been watching the Thunder. Uh, we played the Rockets last night. Got they lost it, they? But yeah, uh, we didn't play all of our starters the whole game, so it's okay. it's fair. no big deal. Fair. But um, Chet and Hartenstein looking great together. It's oh. just Gosh. I'm so excited for the, the defense the the Thunder are about to bring on the league this year. Do we Can't have wait. do we have like a a nickname for those two yet? Uh, not that I've seen. So nothing like. I mean, I feel like I feel like in the modern era, you can't really say Twin Towers anymore. Like, if you can't have like two big guys, you call the Twin Towers. I think that yeah. has passed us. It's, it's over. The first thing um, that came into my mind though was the Krispy Kreme Towers, but I don't know if you could work with that. <laughs> Um, I don't I'm not sure. I do know for a fact I am headed out of state tomorrow and I will be oh. putting down some gambling on them to win the championship for sure. Are, are you heading out of state for the purposes of gambling? No. Oh, okay. Work work related, but I will have I will be in a state where gambling is allowed and then I'll go back to the state to collect my winnings uh when in they June win of next year. So you're saying so you can't gamble in Oklahoma? No. You can smoke weed, but you can't gamble? I can't smoke weed, but yes. Other people that have Oh, because you don't have a medical, medical exception? Medical card, yeah. Oh, okay. You could smoke weed if you wanted to, though. Also, I learned recently that there is a... And I hope that I'm not... I, I was scared about this the other day. I was thinking, like, this seems like a little bit of a bending of the rules situation. Uh -huh. So I hope, I hope I'm not putting anybody on blast. But there are, like, sports books that offer... Pick them, uh -huh. quote unquote, and that you can pick six different players to hit a specific stat line okay. in football. Yeah. And if that happens and you beat the odds, then you get money from the sports book. But that's not sports gambling, quote unquote. Because it's a skill? I have no idea. Okay. But yeah. There's there's just a list of items like the WNBA stat lines, the NFL stat lines, there's just, you can pick, and it's, yeah. it's legal in Oklahoma and other states that gambling's not legal, but you can pick, mm. and then it'll give you odds based on how many things that you picked, and then you get paid out. And again, I'm not trying to get anybody in trouble, so... This, yeah. is, this podcast is for entertainment purposes only, if anyone comes asking, but <laughs> uh, yeah. I found it really interesting. That's, that's, um, yeah, I mean, maybe, you know, your state is, uh, currently working on funneling a bunch of money to Donald Trump. So maybe after that, they'll get on that and get it worked out. Oh Lord. <laughs> Not God to get political. <laughs> um, okay. So let's get this party started. Uh, on April 1st, 1965, any guesses? April 1st, 1965. A person was that... born. Oh, born. Okay. So they'd play in the eighties. Or 90s. Yeah. It's got to be 65. 
65. Hakeem Olajuwon. Mark Jackson was born in Brooklyn. The young man grew up in the St. Albans neighborhood in Queens and attended a Catholic school in his hometown. He starred for his high school team, but made a name for himself in the city while playing on the streets. Now, this part that I'm about to get into, I did not know this, and this kind of blew my mind a little bit. You know Mark Jackson, right? Like you, I've got a lot of Mark Jackson thoughts, so I'm excited for this new topic today. Oh, yeah. Like as a coach? Uh, as a joke. Okay. Uh, so the six, three guard also likely inspired his younger brother, Troy to take his game to the streets as well, where he eventually turned himself into one of the more famous street ballers in the game. So do you know who Mark Jackson's brother is? Oh, uh, no, Samuel L. No, <laughs> great, great guess. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Trying to think of anyone named Jackson. Um, unfortunately for Troy, he was not known as nothing to do with Jackson. Uh, he would never turn into the NBA pro Mark was, despite growing to six foot ten. Mark, I think, was six three, so a much bigger guy. Um, but a lot of that comes down to the fact that he was five hundred pounds by his senior year of high school. That said, the man they called Escalade didn't play like he was carrying all that extra weight. And he joined up with the and one mixtape tour to become a street ball legend. Okay. Do you have, do you have any idea that Escalade and Mark Jackson were related? I had no idea. Me neither. I had literally no idea. And I, I like Escalade though. He's one of my favorite. I mean, of course there's the professor hot sauce, uh, sick wit it. Uh, the, the guy who would do like the spider thing after he, I think maybe his name was just spider. I wasn't the most well-versed, but I know the professor. I know Escalade. Um, I think that's the extent of... You know Skip to my Lou. He played in Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's her. You don't know Sick Wit It? No, I wouldn't have, you know, Mm. said it in a Sporkle tournament or anything. (laughs) But you know um, know Whitewater, and you know... um, uh, Oh, no, I forgot all their names now. I was going to name the streetball legends from... um, NBA Street, but I can't think of uh, can't think of any of them except for Whitewater. Yeah. I know what they look like, but I can't. there's there's the 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 Yao Ming guy. There's uh there's the girl. Oh, in the yeah, I uh, sorry, I was back to real people. But you're oh talking no, I'm about... sorry. Um, all right, so let's get back to this. <laughs> he, he he was just Yao Ming, but 100%. not Yao Ming. Um, this story isn't about Escalade though. Uh, Mark would eventually sign to play at St. John's alongside. Chris Mullen. Um, the guard credits Mullen with instilling a love for practice, which helped him win the Haggerty Award and the Big East Defensive Player of the Year Award in 87 okay. while being named an All-American. So it turned into a very, very good player at St. John's. Uh, during his time at St. John's, Jackson developed his unusual free throw ritual, extending his hand and cupping his thumb and index finger around the rim. So it's actually pretty like he just like makes a little target for himself before he shoots free throws. Okay. Uh, it kept Love him focused it. and helped him become a 70, a career 77% free throw shooter. Jackson was selected with the 18th pick in the 1987 draft by the Knicks, joining Patrick Ewing and Charles Oakley to form a deadly trio in the late 80s and early 90s. He won Rookie of the Year in 1988 and made the All-Star team in 1989. During that season, Jackson was playing in a random game at Madison Square Garden when an image was captured that would become the picture used for Jackson's 1989-1990 NBA Hoops basketball card. 30 years later, that card became an interesting cultural artifact. Not because of anything Mark Jackson's done, but because of who's in the background. Do you know anything about the 89-90 Mark Jackson Hoops card? Uh... I don't know anything about any card. I'm not really card uh, knowledgeable. <laughs> okay. So that's good. So you have no idea where this is going yet? No. Okay. I'm excited to learn. Okay. So I, again, I want to state for the record, uh, I'm I'm an amateur historian and, a hamat- and mostly related <laughs> to sports. And we are about to dive very far outside of the sports world for this one. But I did want to get into it because it is tangentially related to sports. And um, it's kind of crazy that these people ended up on the back of or behind Mark Jackson on his NBA hoops card. In fact, that card 
it might be the most expensive card in that set. Despite, I, th- I mean, I don't remember who exactly would be rookies that year. I think there's some pretty solid rookies in there, but Mark Jackson's random like second year card might be the most expensive one there. I think it's like, you know, I mean, it's like $40 card or something, but um, let me tell you why this card has become so famous okay. and is worth not like a ton of money, but worth a decent amount of money, especially when the rest of the set is probably like $10 total. Um, That's funny. So before explaining what happened, we actually have to go back several years to before, to before Jackson was ever born. In May 1944, a man named Jose Enrique Menendez was born in Cuba. Now do you know where we're going? No. What? Okay. <laughs> Just checking. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when he was 16, the Cuban Revolution was beginning and Menendez moved to the United States to attend Southern Illinois University. There, he met a young lady named Kitty Anderson. The two started dating and married in 1963 before moving to New York City, where Menendez earned his accounting career from Queens College. Five years later, the couple had their first son, Joseph. Why are your eyes so big? I recognize the name now. Oh. It's on Netflix. <laughs> I don't know anything that happens, but okay, I know it's great. On Netflix. <laughs> great. That is exactly why I had to get this story done this week because Love I was it. worried you might watch the documentary. <laughs> uh oh. Uh, five years Poster later, looks scary. <laughs> Spoiler yeah. alert. Yeah. Uh, five years later, the couple had their first son, Joseph Lyle, who goes by his middle name. Kitty had been working as a teacher before he was born, but left her job to take care of him. The family soon moved to New Jersey. And in 1970, Eric's, or excuse me, Lyle's brother, Eric Galen was born. And some of these, I might have the wrong pronunciation. I didn't really look it up, but I'm pretty confident about most of them. Uh, the brothers grew up in a wealthy household and attended a prestigious private school in Jersey. Okay. Now, before we go any further, we're not going to break yet, but I do want to say that there is some stuff coming up that's very dark. Uh, so, you know, if you have problems with, you know, abuse and, um, other i mean pretty much anything if you have problems with it uh maybe skip this one and you know don't learn more about the menendezes um in 1976 i like how i say this and i just like make you listen to it i don't know you you probably don't have any trigger warnings that we need to worry about but i don't think i'm okay i don't give you the option to stop (laughs) but it is funny that like there's you all i always hear you say it and i'm like no matter what he says i have to just sit and listen (laughs) could be anything (laughs) Uh, okay in 1970 we'll do it live we'll do it live yeah if you have any trauma come up we just won't post the episode um in 1976 a menendez cousin named diane came to stay with the family later in life she said that lyle told she said that lyle told her her his father was sexually abusing him she claims she then told kitty but she said lyle was lying the brothers claim their father abused lyle until he was eight and then started abusing eric Kitty's sister backed up the claim in a 2017 interview, but her brother described her bro- and her by, sorry, yeah, her brother. So Kitty's brother as well described the allegation as quote bull. Um, either way, things appeared to be not so rosy under the surface at the Menendez household. That said, uh, Menendez, the dad, worked his way up the ranks until he became an executive at Hertz and later at RCA Records. In 1986, the family moved to Beverly Hills where he, when he was appointed to be the CEO of Artisan Entertainment, a film studio and home video distributor that released films like The Blair Witch Project, Requiem for a Dream, and mine and your favorite, National Lampoon's Van Wilder. <laughs> <laughs> a classic. Uh, so they were very well off, you know, like um, lived in Beverly Hills, uh, had a ton of money quote unquote, the, 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 the perfect life, right? Like they had, you know, the, they had anything they would want basically is what you would assume. Right. Um, but you know, as I said, things not quite as good under the surface. Um, at the time, Eric started attending Beverly Hills high school. He had average grades, but proved to be an excellent tennis player ranking 44th in the U S as a junior. Um, meanwhile, Lyle was attending Princeton but was placed on academic probation for poor grades and later suspended for plagiarism. So three years later, well, not through, this was while, this was all happening. He, they moved there and then he, 
that stuff happened. Now we're to August. Now we're on August 20th, 1989, Jose and Kitty were sitting in their Beverly Hills mansion, watching TV. Again, warning. Lyle and Eric walked into the room carrying Mossberg 12 gauge shotguns and opened fire. Jose was shot six times, including a fatal shot to the back of his head. Kitty was shot 10 times before suffering the fatal shot. She was on the floor crawling away when Lyle ran to get his ran to his car to get more ammunition for shooting her in the face. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Rough one. Um, uh, just before you go on, I, uh-huh. I didn't know we were going to get into all that, which is why I didn't bring this up earlier. Okay. But so I haven't watched the show. Yeah. Other than I was out uh, hanging out with some friends and then I came home and my wife was watching the show. Oh, okay. And that is literally what I walked in on. And I was like, hey, you okay? Like, what what's going on? And what are we watching? <laughs> It's kind of a weird thing to just be alone at home. Uh, <laughs> and that was the only scene I saw. And I was just like, I think I'm good. I don't need to watch the, whatever that show's about. Oh, okay. We're, so can I ask, uh, were you watching the documentary or are you watching the recreation? I believe it was a recreation. Okay. Because there is both now. Uh, the okay. documentary was, just came out uh, a couple days ago. Yeah. It was like a scene. It wasn't like a. Yeah. And I think Javier Bardem plays the dad in the show. Yeah. 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 Sorry. That okay. Jog my memory. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, all right. Um, so yeah, so pretty rough stuff. Um, and here we go after killing their parents, unfortunately it doesn't get any better. This is kind of a downer of an episode, (laughs) but, uh, you know, what can you do after killing their parents? The brothers remain in the house expecting the police would respond to gunshots. Uh, they didn't for a while. And so they later left and disposed of their clothes, which had been stained with blood and brain matter and the shotguns along Mahalan drive. Um, which I didn't know was a real place. I thought that was just a movie. That's, that's I love that so much. I mean, I guess I never have been there, but I just always knew. I don't know, like that the movie was about a place. Yeah, I mean, well, this is your this is my Planet of the Apes moment where I you you knew the quote but didn't know what it was from or what they were talking about. But anyways. <laughs> Uh, Lyle and Eric also considered buying movie tickets to a screening of Batman to use as their alibi, but abandoned the plan after realizing that the tickets would be time stamped. So if they use it, the police would know they hadn't been at the movie theater when they said they were. Uh, so instead, they headed to the Haste of L.A. Festival at the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium. When they arrived back home, the police had still not been alerted. So Lyle called 911 and said their parents had been shot by unknown perpetrators. Police finally showed up to the scene and checked things out, but, and this is very key, did not do a gunshot residue test on either of their brothers, which would have shown that they had recently shot, a, they both recently shot a gun. So the police just assumed they were innocent, and they could have, not could have, but in some respects, like, we're going to get away scot-free. That's um, crazy. Uh, so over the next several months, the brothers spent the, I think it's $13 million. They didn't spend all of that, but they they inherited uh, $13 million. They spent it lavishly. Lyle bought a cafe, a Buffalo Wing restaurant in New Jersey, a new Rolex, and a Porsche Carrera. Is that how you say that one? Yes. Okay, wow, look at me. I'm so cultured. Uh, Eric hired a full-time tennis coach and started competing in overseas tournaments. They eventually left, but they and they were still staying in the mansion, but they left it eventually and bought condos in Marina del Rey while also taking extravagant trips to the Caribbean and London. At one point, they sat courtside at a game at Madison Square Garden to watch the Knicks. They're photographed in the background of a Mark Jackson shot that would eventually become his 8990 hoops card. So that that the whole you look at that. <laughs> yeah. Uh so it's pretty crazy. Uh but that... in total. I was just going to say that feels like I, I I don't know the history of crime very well, but like after this comes out that they did it and, you know, they yeah. go to jail. Every cop ever now is like, hey, we we got to ask you like every wife that, you know, her husband got murdered and she calls the cops. The cops have to be like, hey, I know that. It sounds mean, but yeah, 
you're you're the number one suspect now. So oh yeah, I mean yes, I think that I think that probably should have been the case then, and probably was largely the case because it's not like they're the first people to murder someone to try to get money. That's fair, right? I just think of it as like the Menendez moment. Like it, it was so glaring of an oversight. Yeah. Cause like you gotta be, you gotta think like, Oh, these bodies have been here a long time. Yeah. If if you're doing the analytics, I don't know how it works. Forensics, yeah. but yeah, you're like, and then these kids just called us like, Yeah, again, it, it, it's it's very stuff. weird they did. I mean, yeah, I mean, this, this is one of the things you notice. I will listen to a lot of podcasts that are like true crime stuff uh, about old um, murderers and some of the stuff people used to get away with. Justice, like how in the world are the police this dumb? And I, and I mean, I think police can be very dumb still today, but uh, hopefully it's gotten a lot better because sometimes it's just like, what were they doing? Um, and this isn't quite as bad. I mean, like, because they do kind of like view them as suspects relatively early, but it, the, mm. the not doing the gunshot residue test is kind of like a big mistake. And then also like, I don't know how money works very well, but the fact that it's not like frozen for a little bit after a murder is kind of crazy. Like they can just go spend all that money. Uh, and I'm about to say this, it's the next line, but they spent a uh, $700,000 in like nine or 10 months. They just were like blowing through the money. That's like forty five million in today's dollars. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it's it's pretty wild how much they were spending. Um, like that, the courtside tickets for the Madison Square Garden game were like a drop in the bucket for them, probably. Yeah. Wow. Um, but uh, all the while, the police were investigating the crimes. Um, oh, sorry, I just got to. We have ten more minutes until we have to cut for ads. <laughs> all the while, the police were investigating the crimes. At first. They thought that it might be related to mob ties that Menendez had. Um, however, they started to notice that the brothers were spending a lot of money. And so over time, they gradually started to suspect they maybe had something to do with it. They even gave Eric's friend, Cra Craig, <laughs> I said Craig, Craig Signorelli, uh, they made him wear a wire. Uh, but Eric, in the conversation the two had, Eric denied flat out that he'd kill his parents. However, Eric did. And this is where it gets like Hollywood levels of like, you couldn't oh, write no. this. Eric did eventually confess to his psychologist, Jerome Ozeal, but it's patient. You know, they wouldn't, it couldn't be used in court patient client okay. confidentiality. Yep. Ozeal told his mistress, Judalon Smythe. Smythe and Ozeal then broke up. And Smythe went and told the police about the brother's involvement in the oh murder. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So if it had not been, I mean, they probably would have gotten caught eventually, but in some ways, if these two had not had a big breakup, they might not have ever gotten caught. Um, That's, uh, does privilege go beyond legality? Of, we need uh, a, a lawyer in here or a well, psychologist. So like you, you, they can compel you to testify. They can force you to testify, oh, okay. but Unless they like have another thing, I this is I, I'm not a lawyer. This is just how I understand it from reading Twitter lawyer stuff. Um, unless they already have charges, I don't think they can just like I don't I don't think he has to go tell somebody. Mm. Uh, but you probably would, I would assume. But for whatever reason, he didn't. Um, so I don't know. I've always we need a legal expert on it. Yes, on a, you're on correct. Yeah, again, we are, we are amateurs. I've always wondered, like, if I just tell my lawyer I killed a bunch of people, do they, like, can they just go to the cops and be like, he did it? I mean, it's weird. I don't know how the system works, but I, don't I assume that can't happen. But I, okay, my, my expertise is from, and I'm not, I shouldn't call it expertise. My knowledge is from uh, reading Twitter. And watching the Sopranos, and on the Sopranos, he just he just like doesn't say what he does, and she's just like, "Don't tell me if you killed anybody." And he's just like, he went to a different place, you know, like he oh, uses man. like code words. Um, you but, know, there's some dummy out there that just like says all this stuff yes. to their lawyer, though. Uh, in and, fact, we're talking about one of them. I mean, I I don't know. It's probably I just feel like there's got to be a crime that's bad enough where the lawyer is yeah. allowed to go. I got to break confidentiality here. <laughs> I you mean, to, there's, you there, have to there, go to jail. I think there definitely has to be ways for it to be possible, but I don't know for sure. Nah. I'm again, not an expert. I don't know. 
Uh, write in, yeah. If you're a legal expert, write in and uh, yeah, we'll talk about it later. Leave us a comment about how it's supposed to work. <laughs> um, but yeah, so on March 8th, 1990, Lyle was officially arrested and Eric turned himself in three days later. And I should say, I guess, he, uh, let me finish it. Eric turned himself in three days later after returning from a trip to Israel. I should say that part of it was that they wanted, this is what they say uh, in the future. Um, if you watch the documentary, they talk about this. The brothers wanted to, they kind of wanted people to know that they had, that they had done it. Like they felt bad about it, obviously. Mm. Um, but they were afraid of what was going to come out about their dad uh, in the future from the trial, which we'll also get to in a second. But so it's not, it's kind of, it's a very okay. like, it's like, I wanted someone to know, but I didn't want someone to know type of thing, you know? Yeah. So it's definitely like a very messy situation. It wasn't just like, oh, I'm just going to accidentally let this slip. It was like, I want this to slip on purpose because I kind of want to get caught because I feel really bad about it. It's kind of one of those kind of things, you know? So uh, some of the Ozeal tapes were eventually ruled inadmissible in court, but as far as I could tell, most of them were allowed to be le used in later proceedings. So we're going to hop into the trial here in a second, but first we need to take a break for all of the great ads we're going to run. Uh, so we'll see you in a second. I hope you enjoyed all of those great ads we just had. Um, I'm sure they're all wonderful. Uh, hopefully you learned about um, Ryan Seacrest's love of Chumba Casino and all of those other great podcast ads. Uh, I get a lot of ads. Do you get this? My uh, Probably not. My wife uh, does Duolingo. And so I think yeah. my phone hears her talking in Spanish. I get a lot of ads in Spanish. And I say, uh -huh. I don't know what you're selling me, ma'am or sir. I, I don't think I've had that many. Well, don't hang out with Amy because that is going to happen a lot. All I right. do know that your wife does more Duolingo than maybe any person on the planet. Her streak is... Uh, legendary i don't i don't want to i don't want to get into it but let's just I, I she doesn't really i mean she knows spanish pretty well but it's no longer about learning spanish it's about beating people on the leaderboards it's a game for her now oh she's gonna be number one of all time she wow. wants to be yeah um so during the trial the defense argued sorry i just hopped right back in uh let's hop back in during the trial the defense argued that the brothers had carried out the killings out of fear for their lives after a lifetime of abuse. It was alleged that their father was, quote, a cruel perfectionist and a pedophile. Meanwhile, their mother was described as, quote, enabling, selfish, and a mentally unstable alcoholic and drug addict. The claims were supported by testimony of two cousins of the brothers who described acts that I won't get into, but it's safe to say that it's not good. Uh, not good at all. Not something your dad should be doing to you as a, his okay. kid. Uh, if you want, again, if you want to know, if you want to hear the brothers say the acts, you can watch the documentary because it has it in there and it's not fun to listen to. Uh, before I say this next part, it's important to note that this was 1993. So times were very different. That doesn't excuse anything. But just remember why some of the things that happened probably wouldn't fly in the modern day. Uh, the prosecution claimed the killings were done for financial gain, which, you know, you could definitely see that. They spent a lot of that money. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but Lyle's prosecutor also argued that, quote, men cannot be raped because they lack the necessary equipment to be raped, end quote. So there was a big thing going around that it was like, oh, that's impossible. You That could not happen to a guy because it's it just can't happen. Like this was like parodied on SNL. Uh, there are all kinds of stuff happening around this trial. Mm. Uh, and so I don't think a lot of it would still be a thing. Thank if God. It happened nowadays. <laughs> yeah. um, Eric testified that a few weeks before the killings, he told his brother about the abuse, abuse he'd been experiencing and their father threatened to kill him if they did not keep the abuse secret. So the night of the killing, they claimed that their father's den door was closed, which was for reasons that I didn't really understand was strange to them. And because the door was closed and because of what he'd said before, they were fearful for their life. They went outside to get the guns, walked into the room and without saying anything, just started firing. Uh, the trial ended with deadlocked juries. So perfect. Like they, you know, they were, couldn't come to an agreement. Um, so then the brothers were retried 
And I didn't really say this, but the first time it was like on court TV, like it was basically like all over the news all the time. Oh my gosh. Uh, the second time, or maybe even the third time, uh, the cameras were not allowed in the courtroom after the first trial had become a worldwide spectacle. Again, I, I, I don't want to get this to make this too long and I don't want to like show my ass too much about how much I don't know. So I'm skipping a lot of uh, important legal stuff. But what you need to know for the purposes of, you know, our little basketball podcast is that uh, the brothers were convicted on two counts of first degree murder and conspiracy to murder. They were sentenced to life in prison without parole, but did not get the but did not get the death penalty because they didn't have a criminal record or a history of violence. The brothers were sent to a maximum security prison and kept separate until 2018 when Lyle was moved into the same unit as Eric reuniting them for the first time in nearly 22 years. They have filed various appeals over the years, but never really got too much traction. However, in 2023, they requested a new hearing based on new evidence that allegedly proved that their father had also molested boy band member Roy Rosello when he was a member of Menudo, who his father had signed as like an act for RCA records. Okay. Okay. Um, also Menudo, I don't know if you know this, that's Ricky Martin's band. Uh, yeah, oh, I'm, I'm the biggest Ricky Martin fan. <laughs> of course I knew that. I mean, everybody knows about living La Vida Loca, uh, as of October 3rd. So seven days ago, 2024, the Los Angeles district attorney said his office is actively reviewing the appeal. So potentially something could change in their case. I don't know if it okay. should change or not. Right. Yeah. Like. It's kind of, you know, if you watch the documentary, you get to hear a lot about, the, you get to hear them talking because they're finally like allowed to talk for the first time. And there's some stuff where like the younger brother, Eric feels really bad that he like brought his brother in on this mm. and him telling his brother about the abuse is like the whole reason they're both in jail now. Wow. And the older brother's like, oh, did I really protect my brother? Because yes, I, you know, got rid of that one problem, but now his whole life has been over created a much uh, bigger one. Was, yeah. You know, you, like Eric was 19 when it happened. Wow. So, wow. It's all pretty crazy. Um, but yeah, so of course, like I said, several times, there's much more to learn about the Menendez brothers. If you want to, uh, in fact, as I just mentioned, a new Netflix documentary literally came out last week called the Menendez brothers. Um, there's also, as Dave said, there's the, recreation i guess that's very it. scary dramatization of the yeah. events that unfolded. Uh, i don't know how deep it goes uh, yeah i don't i yeah i have no idea if that one's like good or not i will say i had already done all the research and then i watched the documentary and there are a couple places where i'm like mm, that's not really what happened but it's like as close i mean and maybe i am wrong right like maybe yeah. i don't know what i'm talking about but it is really you know it's a pretty good one uh, it's a decent watch um but also and by decent watch, I mean like intriguing and like tells you the story. I don't mean like, oh, I'm having so much fun watching the story about these two brothers that killed their parents because that would be a weird thing to be excited to watch. Um, but but uh, it's it's wow. it's it's worth a watch, I think. Um, okay, I'll have to check this out. As for Mark Jackson, because we don't want to leave him alone, <laughs> right? He still has a, pl a part to play, in, not a part to play in the story, but he's still involved uh, in our lives. He'd never make another all-star team and became a career journeyman. He was also the target of an extortion scam after his playing career over, after his playing career was over that involved an extramarital affair. Uh, so basically, as I understand it, he had an affair uh, or maybe like went to a strip club okay. and took pictures of himself and the girls <laughs> naked. And then um, they, uh, they tried to like extort him for money. And now he's like a pastor. So it's, you know, it seems it's a very you know, Mark Jackson thing to do. Yeah. Um, Based on um, his television personality, I don't know the guy. Uh, um, I'm not saying the Menendez brothers showing up in his hoops card turned out to be a cor a curse on Jackson, but I'm not not saying that either. either. Uh, though he was, you know, he's a pretty solid player, just not all star level anymore. So that is the story of Mark Jackson and the Menendez brothers. Uh, a very dark one for this one. We'll probably do a le little less dark one next time, but again. I was afraid you would watch the documentary mm. and then I would start talking. I would say, Mark Jackson, you'd be like, is this going to be about the Menendez brothers? <laughs> so uh, is the, the card is in the documentary. I'm assuming. I think it's very briefly mentioned or okay. not mentioned at all. Like so it's we're not, not going to, we're not going to talk about Mark Jackson's coaching career. Oh, can. What do you want to talk about? Mark Jackson's coaching career. Uh, the, Tell me how much you in, hate him. 
So uh, this is all allegedly. I don't remember the story. Did, am I? And maybe I'm. I'm not thinking of a different guy. He was fired for he was. Uh, he called Steph and Clay the best shooting backcourt of all time. Turns out he was very right about that. But he got Yeah. fired, taken over by Steve Kerr, Steve Kerr, who ended up winning four championships with Steph and And counting. Clay. And that's right. And well, Clay's gone, so. Oh yeah, Um, true. but Steph, Mark, Steph probably gone too soon. so Hopefully. part of that team was, uh, Jason Collins was there. Okay. The, he's the openly gay NBA player that came out while he was playing there. Okay. And then He's Mark, a big dude, right? Like a center yep. from Stanford. yep. I don't know about Stanford. Sorry. I Oh, said, okay. yep. I don't know. Um, but Mark Jackson's weird, you said earlier, he's like a pastor now or whatever. I think so. While you're He talking, had some, I'll look it up to make it sure. yeah. And again, I think it was reported that he said this. I don't know that he ever came out and said anything, Mm hmm but it was reported allegedly that he said some inflammatory things about, you know, Mm. gay people. And then he got fired and he said, uh, like basically was calling some executives gay as a Yes. lure. Like he was, he was saying wild stuff about gay people. Yeah. And I don't, now that I've heard this Menendez brother story, it's like, is any of that connected? Not that, I don't think not so, that he knew. but If he's, if he knows about, if he knows about the card and all that, but, And then he said he, so he left coaching, he became a broadcaster, and he said one of the most outlandish things that's ever been said in any sports broadcast ever which about is. LeBron's wife. Do you remember saying that he would Oh, knock it out of the park with LeBron's yeah, wife? I do. I that one's always in like the most out of pocket things announcers say. He's the most out-of-pocket person that's ever been in the NBA. Oh, sorry, that that's not true, but... Every time I read about Mark Jackson, it's like he said something inflammatory or insane about somebody else. Yeah, he's he's kind of yeah. He is I don't a have it like I don't dislike him or anything, yeah. but I, I'm just like every time he signs a contract extension or whatever, I'm like, why do we we can do so much better than Mark Jackson? I'm sorry, Mark Jackson. I don't I don't know the guy. He he is a licensed minister, but I don't. I think he's still working in. No, he was replaced by Doris Burke and Doc Rivers uh, in 2023. So I don't know if he's still working at all in media, but yeah, he is just a licensed minister, not a like. I don't know if he's like a working pastor. Did you know they tried to be on the Dominican Republic's team because he's partially Dominican, uh, but FIBA refused to allow him to. <laughs> Sorry, I just read that. But yes, Oh. Like he uh, couldn't get on Team USA, so he's like, let yeah. me, let me try So to. it, uh, this is just Wikipedia. So, you know, I mean, they do have like real sources, but yes, Jackson's time as a head coach of the Warriors was marked by allegations of intense religious rhetoric and homophobia. Jackson had reportedly ranted about two staff members who were openly gay. So, yeah, so you have it as far as I can tell. Correct. It does not have anything about him saying, oh, I wish I could remember the quote because it is like he's like. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever he says is crazy about It was something LeBron's about knocking wife. out of the park or, Yeah. and it, and then later he's like, oh, that's not what I meant. It's like, <laughs> okay. yeah, he's, he's wild. He's, I mean, to sit next to Jeff Van Gundy or no, is it Stan? No, it's Jeff. He was It's with Jeff, Jeff right? Yeah. To sit next to Jeff Van Gundy and be the crazy one is, uh, <laughs> so it's a feat, it, it, feat anyone of broadcasting. that wants a good laugh, you gotta just type in Mark Jackson out of pocket comments. That's, I mean, that's just like a little bit on the surface. There's, He's crazy. Yeah. Is, you know, my favorite announcer is the, uh, the, the pellet, no, the Hornets guy. Hornets guy's crazy. Oh, I don't know. He doesn't say anything like too wild, but he'll like, he just like yells a lot and he says like weird things. And then there's one, he goes, he's like, I think it's like, I think he'll go like hi ho diddly. And so he, and or he goes like, how do you do? when people dunk and then there was one time where he yelled and then he go and then people had been making fun of him on twitter so he was like i'm sorry lamello ball how do you do like just like very quiet he's, he's so funny Yeah, I I honestly the Thunder announcers are so bad, the local ones, that I ah try to watch the like away games if I can yeah on League Pass. <laughs> they 
Remember they they used to have that guy that got he got a uh, he did the the uh, Russell Westbrook and I'm 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 gonna say the quote. This is a quote from an announcer, not from me. I quote that he got fired it. over. He got fired to, for saying this, and you shouldn't say it. But he said that Russell Westbrook was out of his cotton pick in mind. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so what are you doing? How can you say that? How yeah, can you home, say that? Homer announcers are just hilarious, and so I love listening to other teams' Homer announcers because they're just oh, as bad as ours. It's um, so good. Oh man, yeah. The Vikings' Homer announcer is. Um, I think it's, it's not Alan Page, is it? It's somebody who used to play in like the seventies, mm. and he's so funny. He's he's a crazy man, and he like cries on air when they lose and stuff. It's amazing. Is there a guy from the Vikings named Jared Allen? Is that real? Are you joking? Are you trying to like do a bit? <laughs> he's got long hair and like a beard and stuff. Are you? Is this a bit? I really don't know. Are you really? I don't know his his, his first name. It's Allen, right? Yeah, Jared Allen. Jared Allen. See. No, I'm saying like, of course, it's Jared, Jared Allen's like one of the, you know, of the past 15 years, one of the most famous Vikings players yeah. of the team. <laughs> Vikings suck. So, okay, that is not one. All right, look. Okay. Let's look at his look. record every year. <laughs> no, 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 because that's not how it works. The Vikings <laughs> are the winningest franchise in NFL history that has not won a Super Bowl. That's they fine. have not had like more than three back-to-back -back losing seasons since like the 1960s. Man, if they, you take the the Sonics out of the Thunder history, the Thunder got to be there. Oh my gosh, they've won so much. Oh yeah, I, I mean, I'm saying no. I said in NFL, not in yeah, sports. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Okay, sorry. Just, you said that and it made me think. But uh, the Vikings don't win anything, but they always are good in the regular season. The always. point is, Jared Allen should be. He's super interesting. Yeah, but we're not a football podcast. And he's funny. Uh, he should be on the commentator team. Oh, okay. I mean, we maybe we'll break into football after we run out of stories. If he but... wants to show up here, he's... Oh, my gosh. One. If we got Jared Allen up, I would wear my jersey. <laughs> Is that what you were looking for? It's right there. Yeah, I mean, I could grab it. Um, I just... I knew who he was. I just couldn't remember his... I, I, I thought it was like Jarrett or Jared. I couldn't fully remember everything. Let's go. <laughs> of course, that's his number. It's a nice jersey number. That's yeah. That's I do hate insane. these jerseys, but um, I love Jared Allen. But I love I'm Jared Allen. For, I'm happy for that. He was also a chief, which makes it tough because I'm a chief hater. Always have been. Always will be. Um, speaking of, can I talk about? I know this is this is we're just going completely off topic, but yeah. one thing I hate is when you hate a team for like a very specific reason. So I hate the chiefs because I had friends that were always, there were chiefs fans and they were really annoying about it. Yeah. So I've hated the chiefs since like 1997. And now everyone's like, Oh, it's, it's cool to hate the chiefs now yeah. because I have Patrick Mahomes. And I'm so mad about it. It's like, I was here in the de the dark days when hating the chiefs wasn't cool. Yeah. You're a, when that happens. It you're also a hipster, happens, a hipster hater. Yeah. I'm a hipster car Maria hater too. So <laughs> challenge I, I hate it every time i'm like you were here you were here for the dark days when everyone loved them because they were you the were lovable losers that. um in nba news speaking of minnesota we we haven't talked about the carl anthony towns trade are you do you think that the Timberwolves are gonna go to the finals now i think that was a bad trade for both teams wow i think it's a rare trade where both teams lose in the end they're rare both bad wow yeah i think that cat is soft i think that Cat is not going to fill the the position they need him to fill. Uh, that like iHeart was playing. I think Mitchell Robinson might leave, which would be even worse. Like he has made it very clear he's like mad about the trade and oh, isn't wow. happy. Uh, from what I've seen, again, it's I, I guess maybe made it clear is a bit strong because I'm pretty sure I'm when I say made it clear, I mean he's like posted stuff on Instagram. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, I just don't think it's good for. The Knicks, as far as I think it's good for like two games. If they need to win a game seven, I think, yeah, now they have a way better starting five. But I think like over the long haul, I think it's a bad move. Uh, but I also will say I'm a Knicks hater. I kind of hate the current iteration of the Knicks. I don't like Jalen Brunson. I don't think he's as good as people think he is. Uh, I don't, I, I love, but I will say, let me just say this love. One of probably one of my top 10 favorite players in the NBA is Josh Hart. Love that man to death. So I wish all the okay. best for Josh Hart. 
The rest of them, I, you could leave them at the door. I don't care about any of them. I don't like Thibodeau. I think he's a bad, I think he's a really good coach, but I think he's a dummy that's too like stuck in his ways. As far as the, the, the Timberwolves go, I don't think they make them a better team this year. Mm. Although I do think there's something to be said about Julius Randle uh, being able to come in and play like a creating position with the second unit when Ant goes off the floor and Conley goes off the floor. So I think they could theoretically be more versatile, uh, but I don't think they have a higher ceiling now. The thing that I will say is I think if they get rid of Randall and get some contract space, because that's like basically the way they had to make the move is because they know they have to pay Ant. I think it like makes them better in the long term to not have cat. Yeah, they got rid of uh, three years of paying cat sixty million dollars. Yeah, plus. I think I think cat is like I, like cat is one of those players, and there's a lot of these guys in the NBA now because the cap is out of out of control. One of these guys that like doesn't really deserve to be a max level player, <laughs> but he's gonna be, and he's like on the cusp, right? Like there are definitely guys like Julius Randle is probably gonna get paid like whatever his max is. But he doesn't. Does he really deserve to be a max level player? No. But it's just the way the NBA works now. Yeah. Cat is like. Cat is like the most skilled big man maybe that's ever lived. Like he could. She's you know obviously one of the best big man shooters. Maybe Shooting, the best. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He can you know he you know he he does some stuff off the dribble that other big guys can't do. Um, but is he like? Is he like a top twenty five player? I'd have to do my rankings, but I don't think so. Just like off the eye test, I don't think Cat is a top 25 player. He's maybe right in that range of 20s for sure. Yeah, probably. But but the, but to me, like only the max, right? I guess I guess you would say the max should be 30 guys, right? 30, one yeah. you should have one max per team, right? Maybe you should, could say that. But I don't think he's, he's worth at the, the lower max. end of the spectrum of max players, yeah, for sure. Yes. And like a part of it is like uh, when I grew up, people actually played defense, and so I value defense a lot. It's I got people got mad at me in, on YouTube, and I guess this is going on YouTube, but they got some people got mad at me when I had KG over Kevin Durant uh, in my rankings uh, as as the, for the best uh, McDonald's All Americans. Mm, yeah. And I get it; I understand why people would say KD is better than KG. I think you're crazy. I think KG is like one of the top That's five close. defenders of all time. That's close. But I mean, you could people will say Durant is a top five offensive player of all time. I don't know if I agree, but he's up there. Yeah. So I don't know. Do you think it's good for them? I've some people I've heard are like pretty positive. Like it feels like Knicks fans are happy about it, which I think is crazy because I think it I think it raises the Knicks ceiling. I think that they can go toe to toe with more teams. I think that I don't Randall think they can. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Finish what you're saying. I was just gonna say I think that Randall I think that Cat will space the floor much better. Yes. Which I think Brunson I, mm. drive and kick is mm -hmm. what you want to see. Yeah. And I just, I think it, I think they'll score more points. I think that you're wrong on both accounts where it matters because they have to, the, the title goes through Boston, right? On mm -hmm. the East. Like if you want to win a title, you got to go through Boston. Uh, Tingus Pingus is just as good at going out and spreading the floor on offense, but he actually plays defense. Like he's actually a rim protector. Cat does not have any interest in being a rim protector. I was and, just going to say, I think cat can play perfectly against Tingus Pingus. I, I think no way, no way. I Chris don't want him against him for lunch, you know, Embiid. I think that's going to be a big problem. Yeah, but, he, man, he's going to murder him. Embiid will kill him, but we also have Robinson around. I, I think it just gives you options, and I think, yeah, the ceiling is higher. And then for Minnesota, I think the the floor is higher. Like, yeah, or have maybe better guys in the in like to play, and so it'll be harder to lose games. But I just don't see them beating the Mavericks or the Thunder or the Celtics or the Knicks. Like, I think they're kind of stuck. They do need, I feel, yeah, I feel like Rudy kind of hurts their team in a lot of ways. Uh, but Devo is like a sneaky, great pickup. Yeah. Like, that's that's what I'm, I think their, their depth is better. Like, yeah. I think overall, 
it, they've got good pieces. They probably didn't need to keep the three of Gobert, Cat, and Nas Reed. So Nas Reed, what a god. I get it, but I just don't think it makes them any like better. I don't think they're going to match up better with anyone now. Yeah, uh, one we can end whenever you want. Um, but one last thing I do have to say before, about Cat is that I have heard, and I haven't done the stat looking up my, myself because I don't care. I don't like him. Uh, I don't think he's any good. But I have heard people who have looked at stats, and he is like an abysmal and unwilling corner three point shooter, and he has like one of the worst rates of like catch and shoot because not like he's bad at shooting catch and shoot or that he can't shoot from deep because obviously he can, but that he more often than not, like takes too long to make a decision on the catch and shoot. And so he gets covered when he has wide open shots, but it gets covered more quickly because he takes time to like, think about what he's going to do. Mm. And he has so many like bad plays where he thinks he's like a really good creator and does like these crazy passes that, you know, you'd see like Trey young do, but he's cat. So he can't do them. Um, and they like leads to like easy turn. And, I, and you know, to some degree, Randall has that same problem as well, but Randall, I think is a better creator. I just think like cat is like, so one time it was described to me as, and this is going to be a, a bit of an odd, uh, analogy, but the, um, uh, what is his name on, uh, on the show where the three guys, it's three guys, workaholics, Adam yeah. divine. Is that his name? Yep. One time it was described to me that Adam Devine is like one like change of his face from being really hot. Like there's like something about him that's like like not that he's ugly, right? He's better sure. looking than I am, of course. Um, but there's like one like little thing about like if you had like one tweak, if you were, you know, if you were making a person and you had to tweak one little thing about his face, you would be super hot. He'd be drama, not comedy. Yeah. Yeah, there is something kind of goofy about. I think that's true look. about Cat. I think Cat is there's like one little tweak that has to be made that he would be, you know, an incredible top 10, top 15, top 5 maybe even player, but it's not there. And it's never I mean he's 30 years old. Yeah. It's not going it to happen. It's crazy how fast they get old. It's not going to happen. Yeah. So, I don't know. I I am a I am a I'm down on Cat. I've always been down on Cat. I've always been down on Thibodeau. Uh I've always been down on Brunson. I'm a Brunson hater. What, loud and proud Brunson hater. Um, I just, I don't know. I don't think their system like is built to work in the playoffs. And I don't believe that they could beat the Celtics. I really don't wouldn't even be surprised know. if they prove you wrong. You wouldn't be surprised. Would not. I wouldn't be surprised if they lost to the Pacers again. Siakam is going to so. eat that man alive. So. We'll see. Tyrese. Are you kidding me? Tyrese is going to destroy Brunson. I don't think so. I think that they lose to, and then like, what are they going to do if they get matched up against Philly? What? And they're healthy. Of course you got to say that you got to say that. What are they going to do against Joel Embiid, PG and Maxi? Like, how are they going to defend that? And PG doesn't even have to play off. The, or off Those the three will not make it healthy through the playoffs. I, I know. I know. But what, what if, if they're healthy? Yeah. That's going to, there's no, I, I feel like they're like at best case, the third best team in the in the East, assuming everyone's healthy. And if yeah. you're assuming, and if you, if you say, oh, well, uh, PG or Embiid are going to get hurt. Well, I mean, like the Knicks have been, have hurt players every year too. So like, you can't just That's say, true. you can't be in a vacuum and be like, oh, these guys are going to get hurt, but Cat's going to stay completely healthy when he hasn't had a healthy season in like four years. Has he been that hurt? Uh, I think so. I, I mean, again, I haven't okay. looked it up, but yeah. he's, he's definitely had injuries. Like I said, I think it raises the ceiling. I I, I still think it could crash and burn, but I, I do think... Oh, I'm hoping. Please. The amount of points I follow they some Knicks people on Twitter. With their system is just going to be out, out of control. They will, they will score a lot, yeah. They're going to have a ton of games where you go, oh, dang, they're the best team in the league. Wow, no one can beat them. Mm, not me. I won't say that. Now they'll get the right matchup the next night and look pedestrian but i just i I, I still don't think anybody has the juice to take down the celtics the thunder for sure do easy no no way nobody easy. can touch pingus pingus too good i do easy. i think i mean like who's gonna who's gonna stop tatum uh i don't know lou dort or <laughs> alex think, caruso are you kidding me i don't think either of those guys could j-dub stop but then okay but the, 
if they do, then who's going to stop Brown? Because they have the, like one of the other two guys. I just I named? don't I don't think so. I think that's crazy. I think the Jada Thunder are very good. Or... I think the well, Thunder are very very good. I think the Celtics are just a little bit better. I would love for, for you for you guys. I would probably. love to see the Thunder win for uh, my my home state. We need um, it. Come on, you, got, you guys. You, de- you deserve it. But really, this year I'm rooting. I'm all in on the Z, the Zach Eady train. I almost call it the ZD train. I'm, I'm hoping it's good. I am for Memphis. <laughs> I am not super confident in Jaw coming back for yeah. Maybe no, hasn't played in. Yeah, I don't think I don't think Jaw will be that great. But whatever. What but can you do? I'm, we got to be excited, you know. Yeah, I think it's going to be. I think I think you're probably going to see. I think it's it will come down to either. Oh. Something just happened on my computer. Uh, I think it'll come down to Celtics, Thunder. Like my four teams, I would pick those two. Then probably I would say Philly. And then who else in the West? I don't really love Dallas that much. I think they kind of like surprised people because they weren't like, you know, I feel like, feel like to some degree you could figure them out now to some degree, maybe. Dallas is the best example of the fact that basketball is the one sport where it's most apparent that like one guy can really shift things. Yeah. Now, obviously, I mean, I don't not sound to take anything away from like Lively and uh, Derek Jones and like they had some great contributors, but Luke Gafford. Just, like, don't forget the Thunder gave them Gafford. Thank you, Thunder. Yeah. Great job, guys. But Luca just like breaks teams. It's crazy. Yeah. I don't know. It I does. Would... I think it takes a special set of circumstances for them to win. Yeah. And it's why they just got trounced by Boston. Yeah. I do still like the Nuggets, but I don't know if that's just because Jokic is my favorite player uh, mm. or what. And then, you know, there, I mean, there's a dynasty brewing out in uh, LA, right? Bronny's here. It's oh. his time, baby. Gotcha. I mean, I never count out the, never count out that LeBron and Steph connected during the olympics and they're gonna mm-hmm. one of them is gonna try and force the way to the other we'll that see. would be incredible what a team we'll lebron see. steph and ad that even that's not even possible there's no way they can make that trade could they uh you know i don't know why not it's the nba they always what, what, out what are they gonna trade for him dalton connect how do you say they, his name? they always figure out a way <laughs> d'angelo russell makes like 30 million dollars a year again people get paid way too much money to be bad at their job why can't I get paid that kind of money to be good at my job? <laughs> oh, brother. They should just pay me. They, they could pay me less than the minimum, and I'll sit on the bench and cheer for you. You'd be a great hot guy. I think I would be. I was really good at it in high school. 100%. All right. <laughs> That's about all uh, we were good for. What do you, uh, all we were good for in high school yeah. basketball? Yeah. Maybe you. No. Some of us knew how to rebound. No. You didn't. What do you mean? I mean that you sat on the bench and we just weren't meant to play basketball. No, we weren't meant to be good at any sports. No, you're wrong. You're wrong. Show us all your, uh, you know, championships you won. I had a triple double in uh, eighth grade basketball. <laughs> Blocks, Damn. never you assists, know rebounds. You're right. Never mind. I'm sorry. And six points. Dang. Okay. Look Some of us knew how to rebound. I, I, I think in eighth grade <laughs> basketball, I averaged like 25 rebounds a game. And I'm not joking. That's not like a joke. That's just like I was, I know I'm good at rebounding. I'm the Dennis Rodman of Oklahoma, small town Oklahoma basketball. So it was just, we see it zip zoop off the rim and we know what's happening. Yeah. And I was one we, of those dudes. And it turned into a prolific career. I mean, I only quit because I didn't want to run. If they hadn't made me run oh. laps all the time, I would have kept playing. And important to, piece of basketball there. The running. With how bad, with how bad our team was when I was there, I probably would have started too because <laughs> we were trash. I'm I'm happy for you. Okay, I can't believe the, you're, you're discounting my rebounding ability. The now. greatest could have been of all time. No way. I w- I would have been terrible. <laughs> That's what I tried saying. But you're saying I don't have any skill. Is all I'm saying. Oh. I'm not. Te- I'm not bad. I'm I was not. I was making a, a general joke about how neither of us really accomplished much in our co- high school careers. Yeah, but I could have. <laughs> right. 
Not really. No. The, the only the only sport I legitimately could have been good at if I if I stuck with it is soccer. Hmm. Because I was I was uh I don't I don't mean to brag, but I'm gonna brag on myself just a little bit. Uh I was being scouted in seventh grade to come for our high school team. The guy was like coming to our games and trying to get me to go to camps and stuff. And then he said, there you go. and then I got to high school and they're like, okay, you're going to play goalie, but also you still have to run five miles with the rest of the team. And I said, no, thank you. I'm playing goalie. Why do I need to run? And so I quit. <laughs> oh my gosh. And that's a good point though. Why do you need to run for goalie? I mean, why do you need, like why do, in football, why do, if I'm a fat offensive lineman, defensive lineman, why do I got to run five miles? Why do I got to do that run where like everyone's running and then you run in front, you got to chase everybody else to get to the front of the line. I'm that's running crazy. for two seconds. I do not need to be able to run miles. Sorry, this is me complaining about high school sports and we're going to get out of here. Uh, we will see you all next time with another, hopefully not as dark story as this one. Goodbye.